and political analyst he is the visiting professor at the university of calcutta in the department of business management and also acted as phd supervisor he is associated with professional bodies namely chamber of commerce and uh, helio international france dr day is also an author of four books and more than 100 research articles published in various national and international journals he has been awarded for best teacher institution builder and best researcher from ibs alumni federation there are so many things about him but without uh, further ado i'd request dr day to start his lecture uh, thank you over to you sir sir you are not audible uh, please unmute yourself sir please Before unmute the, yourself unmute yourself Uh, no sir you you are still hello yes sir yes sir yes sir. Me? yeah thank you now uh thank you kosab uh very good evening to everyone and i must uh, pay my regards to professor chakraborty for a very interesting and illuminating lecture which has made us understand this law very well in a much better way now <clears throat> i just think the ipad is a problem really. can you see me it is not important now uh, just before i start my uh, topic i just want to share a interesting uh, update Uh, just I have received this message from uh, one of my friends. This is about the press statement issued by All India Kishan Sangars Coordination Committee. Few minutes before they issued the statement, they have summarily rejected the committee made by the Supreme Court, and they said, "I quote: Farmers Union reiterated the fact that they will not participate in any court orders, committee process." for that one of our apprehensions about such process not validated in the very constitution of the committee it is clear that the court is being misguided by various forces even in its constitution of a committee these are people who are known for their support for three acts and have actively advocated for the same so with this positive note i would uh, like to uh, start my discussion 
uh, I focus, try to remind uh, Professor Bhakti how much time I, I can spend on this. Half an hour. Half an hour, thank you. So uh, I'll try to remain focused on three basic questions. Yeah, I'll try to remain focused on three basic questions. Number one, should government use taxpayers' money to subsidize farmers? This is a question which has been raised by many people, uh, especially uh, few uh, politicians and economists. Second, why farm laws at this point of time? Third, what awaits India if the farm laws are implemented? Coming to the first question, whether the should whether government should use taxpayers' money to subsidize farmers. The, the question must be addressed. First, understanding the situation of the farmers and situation of the agricultural sector that we are into in this very time. Uh, I must, uh, uh, to save time, what I'm, I'm thinking, I must uh, read out some of the notes which I have made. Uh, and I have circulated to my colleagues over there uh, that can be circulated later on. But I just read out uh, to save time. Successive governments have provided farm subsidies using taxpayers' money due to various compulsions. Agriculture always faced adverse terms of trade since 1980s. And since mid-2000, the farming community has consistently faced adverse terms of trade compared to non-farmers. In 1950-51, the share of agricultural GDP was 45%, and 70% of nation's workforce was dependent on this sector. At present, the corresponding shares are 16% and 50%. I repeat, in 1950-51, agriculture contributed 45% of the GDP and 70% of the population, that is India's workforce, were engaged with agriculture, now it is 16% of the GDP and 50% of the Indian workforce are still engaged with this. That means constant erosion of the farmer's income was an outcome of the growing inefficiency in the farm sector. In 2019, India's rank among other countries in terms of wheat and rice yields were 45 and 59 respectively. In terms of wheat, we rank 45 among other countries who also cultivate wheat. In terms of rice, we rank 59 compared to other countries who also cultivate rice in terms of the yield per hectare or per acre, whatever it is. The share of investment in farm sector to the total investment in the country has consistently fallen over the decades. In 1950s, the share was 18%. In 1980s, it fell to around 11%. And during 2014 and 18, it shrank further to 7.6%. So this is the share of total different sectors. This is the share of agriculture's investment out of the total investment, only 7.6% where 50% of the Indian workforce are still engaged in different ways. Every government has systematically ignored the need for investment in the farm sector. All problems are tried to be resolved through ad hoc manner without proper long-term policy. For example, USA reviews and enact farm legislations in every four years since 1933, the New Deal year. And the European Union enacted their common agricultural policy in 1962, and every year or every alternate year, they review it. WTO shows in 2018, the government has provided $56 billion in terms of, in the form of agricultural subsidy. In my note, which I have uh, circulated, cost of please note, I made a tip. Uh, uh, mistake, it will be 56 billion, though I had written 65, it was just a typo. So please correct that, 56 billion. In recent past, the largest component, around 43% of these subsidies were provided to, quote, 
low income and resource poor farmers. According to Government of India's definition, 99.43% of farmers fall under this category, that means under low income and resource poor farmer category, who have less than 10 hectares of land. Now the question remains, then who gets the rest of the 57% of subsidies provided by the government? If this 99.43% poor farmers get only 43% of the subsidies which have been provided, then who gets that rest 57% of subsidies that needs to be explored? USA and European Union provide huge subsidy to their farmers. In 2017 and 18, the US and UN EU government have provided 131 billion and 93 billion respectively to the farmers. If we compare the ratio of the farm subsidies to the agricultural value addition to India, US and EU, EU, European Union, then the, then the figure speaks the real picture. The corresponding ratios are, in case of India, it is only 12.4%. In case of US, it is 90.8%. And in case of European Union, it is 45.3% respectively. That means out of the total value addition, India, Indian government provides only 12.4% of subsidy. European Union provides 45.3% of the subsidy to the farmers. And the great USA provides 90.8% subsidies to their farmers out of the total value addition that, that, that the farmers make every, for every product. Now the question is, is it too high? Is it too taxing for the country? I personally think that it is not that high. It is not at all taxing for the country. These subsidies are required because of the ad hoc policies which the government has taken for the last 70 odd years. These subsidies are required because of the increase in the cost of production of the farms. This is required because that we have followed a policy which is not suitable for Indian farmers. So there is another debate, another discussion, but at this stage we can say very rightly and with, with figures that, that compared to many countries, India doesn't provide a substantial subsidy to their farmers. Now the second question, why farm laws at this stage? Since last two decades, transnational food retailers have been targeting to make India as their global food hub. I repeat, transnational retailers have been targeting India to make their global food hub. 10 years ago, while releasing a study done by CII and Yes Bank, uh, the then uh, minister, Mr. Subodh Khan in, in two, 2010, he was at that time the minister for food processing industry, said, quote, the food processing sector has the potential to become the outsourcing hub for the world and India will be feeding the world in years to come. He said this in 2010. The Conference was attended by more than 50 international companies engaged in food processing and retail. So this new initiative, which we have seen in, 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 in 2020, uh, actually this was started long back, around two decades before. In one of my articles in 2013, I tried to highlight the issues of allowing foreign direct investment, FDI, in India's retail trade from the perspectives of the long-term food security and systematic transfer of valuable natural resources like fertile land and water through virtual mode to develop world. The paper which I had written concluded with an observation that the fertile land and the renewable water resource of the farmers will be used like womb and blood of a surrogate mother by the transnational retailers. Unfortunately, this is very true now. The core competence of India probably lies in its food diversity, water resources in Eastern India, and knowledge of traditional farming community. 
Tropical fruits, organic vegetables, and various types of grains have a ready global market. India has failed to develop any global brand of industrial product. The five major export items of India in 2018-19 were petroleum products, which we also import and we process and then export. Around 14% of our export, export items were petroleum products. Pearls, precious and semi-precious stones, 7.78%. Drug formulations and biological, 4.3%. Gold and other precious metal jewelry, 3.9%. Iron and steel, 2.9%. So here we find that we don't have any product which has got the export market. We don't have much any brand which has got an export market. We rely for export on gold and precious metals. We rely on, for export on imported crude oil, which we re-export after processing it. So it is an easy option for the Indian, uh, Indian, Indian corporate sector along, uh, and also the global corporate sector to consider food export from India as an easier option. Because India is a tropical country, has huge varieties of fruits, vegetables, and so many other things. And still, India has a very large pool of knowledgeable farmers who, which, who can produce varieties of food products with their traditional knowledge. And I, am, I, 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 I fear these will be exploited to the large extent to get the benefit of the international market which this farmers probably won't gain, only the retailers will be getting out of the farmers and gain out of these total transactions. On July 19, 18, 2005, the Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India and US Department of Agriculture agreed to work together to a new India-US knowledge initiative on agriculture, ag education, research, service and commercial linkage. They agreed to work on a plan which included, among others, education, that is preparing graduates to harness science and technology for the pursuit of attaining and sustaining evergreen revolution, which is mentioned, quote unquote. Second, food processing and marketing. Three, biotechnology. Four, water management. To supervise this plan, a board was created consisting of eminent scientists and representatives from the government, NGOs, and private farms. The honorary member, members were Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, who was awarded with the Nobel Prize, and uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan from India. Borlaug was from US, unfortunately he has expired. The architects of the first Green Revolution, both of them, Borlaug and Dr. Swaminathan, were the architect of the first Green Revolution of 1960s. The private sector representatives in the board were, please listen to the names. Monsanto, Archer Daniel Midland Company, and Walmart from USA. And from Indian side, the representing farms are Masani Farm and IPC Limited. To meet this objective, the government had permitted 100% foreign direct investment through automatic route in the manufacturing of food products. From year 2017-18 to the first half of 2019-20, India has received more than 2 billion FDI in the food processing sector. It may be recalled that in January, uh, sorry, in December 10, 1974, Henry Kissinger had submitted a confidential report titled National Security Study Memorandum 200. In short, it is also known as NSSM 200 for US security and overseas interest, also called Kissinger Report to the US government. The Kissinger report identified 30 key nations, India one of them, as the primary targets for population control. And the food was considered as one of the major tools through which the US wanted to achieve its objective. Kissinger commented, quote, if you control the oil, you control the country. If you control the food, you control the population, unquote. Now, these are the basic triggers, I, I feel, which led this government to consider 
enacting new formats in the form of 3x that we have uh, discussed just now, uh, which the government has enacted and on which the farmers are protesting now. Now, uh, my last course, uh, question is, what awaits India if farm laws are implemented? We know that in September, the, the government of India had enacted the farm laws, and I'm not going into the details on the farm laws. Uh, what I'm just trying to highlight the, the uh, consequences of this, uh, obviously, the first one, this, the, the Essential Commodity Act, which has been modified and annulled to a large extent, uh, this will permit almost unrestrained hoarding and higher profit for the holders, as the Act clearly mentions that any action on the imposition of the stock limit should be based on the price rise and other, which Professor Chakraborty has explained in details. So I'm skipping that. The second one, the Farmers' uh, Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Service Act, uh, it, Professor Chakraborty has uh, discussed in details. So I'm coming to the immediate concern, uh, of my concern, and obviously others' concern on this. I think the Act provides a legal sanction for contract farming, under which farmers will produce crops as per contracts with corporate investors for a mutually agreed remuneration. The main concern is corporate investors who run global supply chains will dictate terms and look for short-term gains. They will be primarily interested in the farm output, not on the sustainable development of the farmland. We must recall that the concept of contract farm is not new in India. The indigo planters of the British East India Company started in Bengal in the century. In recent times, contract farming of sugar canes in Maharashtra's Marathwada district has made most of the land almost barren. It is reported that unrestricted, unrestricted use of groundwater for sugar cane farming, which is extremely water intensive cultivation, has aggravated the groundwater crisis of the region. Though farmers have received an assured price from the sugar factories due to contractual agreement, the quality of their farmland has drastically depreciated due to bad farming practices. Experts apprehend that if the existing farming practice continues, water stressed regions such as Varathwada could be heading towards desertification. So when Someone argues that what is the harm when the farmers get assured price for their output? My question to them would be, what is the guarantee that the person who has given them the assured, assured price will be taking care of the land, which is the real asset of the farmer? Here in this case, which I am trying to highlight, the sugar cane cultivators for years got better remunerative price compared to other farmers of that region. They were under contract farming, yes. But over the years, they had to use their own groundwater and now the land has become barren. It has become toxic. The entire district is on the verge of desertification. Do you think that the people who have given them higher price for the sugar cane are going to compensate them for the farmland which is being desertified? Certainly not. Second issue in this case is, as I said earlier, when we promote export of food grains, we also promote export of our water. Water is very expensive nowadays. Water also gets exported in invisible way. It is the embedded form along with the food grains, whatever we export. India is one of the major importers of the beef across the globe. And beef production requires huge quantities of water. When you export basmati rice or any coarse, coarse rice, we also export huge cubic meters of millions of cubic meters of water along with rice or wheat or whatever it we export. 
in india this year due to higher production of sugar canes government of india recently two months before issued 3500 crore subsidy to sugar mills to sugar mills 3500 crore subsidy to sugar mills and sugar exporters as an incentive why they could not sell sugar in the domestic market due to lack of demand our subsidized sugar was exported to usa why indian taxpayers will bear the subsidy to export sugar to usa and give the subsidy to the exporters and the mill owners who could not pay the remunerative price to the sugar cultivators these are the these are the questions that needs to be raised and needs to be raised in every forum now <clears throat> uh professor chakraborty has uh, discussed in detail about the farm produce trade and commerce act of 2019 the apmc he discussed i skip this part uh what i would just uh, like to say that this act that the mandis and which 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 it, it pertains to apmc the impact of this act will be the immediate concern the power and revenue of the state governments will be curtailed which professor chakraborty also also mentioned due to the marginalization of the state apmcs and an agricultural produce market committee is marketing is a marketing board established by the state government this all of us know by now until may 2020 that the first sale of the agricultural produce could occur only in the market years of mandis which they are said now second concern here is this act will create a new few large private buyers who will exercise monopsony power against thousands of small and marginal farmers this is the real concern that i have a study suggests that agricultural output price and credit markets are highly interlinked i repeat agricultural output price and credit markets are highly interlinked weak credit markets result in the in efficient performance of agricultural markets in the absence of proper credit facilities small farmers will be compelled to take loan from the affluent buyers and would sell their produce products at a discounted price farmer farmers will become the price takers the experience of countries where large retailers control food markets suggests rapid erosion of income and farmers income of the farmers particularly the small and marginal farmers an oxfam study of 2004 reveal that while exporting apples from africa to europe the african farmers as a whole got only 9% of the total price of exported apple i i repeat only 9% of the total price of an exported apple the overseas retailers in the uk cornered 42% share and the rest went to other stakeholders like agents packers transporters transporters at all in 1981 a similar un study also suggested a picture of a deprivation of local producers in southeast asia especially uh, pineapple and 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 banana uh, producers of philippines and thailand the corporate intervention in indian farm sector began with the bank in the mid 1960s in the name of green revolution we know that the program initiated by the rockefeller foundation usa had introduced a new cultivation process that is completely dependent on corporate sector for agricultural inputs like seeds chemical fertilizers pesticides sustained water supply the marketing of products was primarily left with the government control mechanism like minimum support price mps a public distribution system pds apmc etc now these three new acts of 220 2020 have shifted the marketing responsibility of the marketing community of agricultural commodities from the state to private corporations thus corporation of india corporate corporatization of indian agriculture has been completed these policy changes 
and huge inflow of FDIs will certainly boost export of food products by transnational corporations, but it will also endanger the food security of millions of economically disadvantaged citizens of the country. Moreover, along with food grains, India will export its precious water in virtual mode as food production consumes huge quantities of fresh water, which is increasingly become scarce in every passing day. The long-term food availability to Indians will be at the stake due to systematic transfer of valuable natural resources like jungle jamin through virtual mode to the developed world. Fertile land and water resources of the farmers will be used, as I said earlier, as the womb and blood of, the surrog of a surrogate mother by transnational food retailers. Since it was, it, 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 it was initiated economic liberation policies three decades ago, India has consistently submitted in the WTO that its agricultural policies are designed to ensure food security and protect farmers from the uncertainties of market forces. India could therefore justify its imposition of high input tariffs by saying they were needed to protect its agriculture from the heavily subsidized products that were traded in international markets. However, consistent or compatible, how consistent or compatible would be the government stand on protecting Indian farmers be with this new found aspiration of turning India, turning the country into agricultural export hub? It is the real question. We always defended us in the WTO saying that we had had to impose higher tariff on agricultural imports because our farmers could not compete with the subsidized price of wheat and other agricultural products from USA or European Union. We have seen that US provides almost 91% of the subsidies on the value addition. European Union provides almost 45%. So we said that we provide only 12 or 13%. So at this stage, we cannot compete with you. Our farmers cannot compete with you. So we had to raise the import duty on different agricultural products. Now we are exporting agricultural products to different countries. Our subsidized agricultural products to different countries. We are not talking about food security of the millions of hungry Indians. We are now saying that India has become an export hub. So if this is the logic, then how would we defend in WTO when US and European Union raise this question, then how you can justify that import duty on agricultural products should be still very high. It means it will force us to reduce the import duty on agricultural products. So India will be a good market for US food products, mainly corn, wheat, because they subsidize immensely. U.S. cotton will be flooding Indian market and U.S. food, different types of U.S. food, which are not gen GMO level because U.S. in USA, U.S. you know that they don't uh, have, they have not agreed to level the GMO foods uh, with the GMO level. So we won't be knowing which of the foods which are, that, that, that those will be imported into India uh, are of GM products, are, 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 are GM seeds. So this is the consequence which I fear will be subjected to. Now, India will be importing lots of, probably lots of GM foods, cheap GM foods from US and other countries, because we'll be forced to open up our protected market our farmers will be forced to export products again through the agents, again through the global retailers to the internal, international markets. And these products which will be exported will be of all green products like on organic products, which will be produced using, not by uh, groundwater, contaminated groundwater, arsenic, contaminated groundwater, but by rainwater, and it will be following, they will be following high standard of production, 
which suits the global consumers. And there will be two distinct types of consumers in the country. One elite group of consumers will be consuming those high-end organic foods. And millions of millions of Indian consumers will be consuming all these kind of junk foods which produced with GM seeds and all these kind of things, which will be important. Now, <clears throat> I'll just take two more minutes. Uh, the Food Corporation of India, along with 500,000 odd fair price shops, uh, probably become redundant. Eventually, FCI go downs and the ration dealers network will be taken over by global retailers like Walmarts and at throwaway price because government is not privatizing everything. So you do not know, maybe the next phase they will privatize FCI. The ration dealers will turn to procurement and sales agents of global retailers. They will procure exotic food items for export and would sell GM seeds, pesticides, low grade imported grains, and animal feeds to millions of poor farmers. The food security of a large section of the population will be at risk. So this is my humble submission till now. If you have any questions, I'll try to address those things. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Bhakti. Thank you, all the panelists, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your erudite lecture. Uh, due to the shortage of time, I'm not going to elaborate the summarization of the speech given by Dr. Day. Just I want to highlight a few of them. As he has uh, divided his lecture by uh, focusing on three major questions. Uh, those are whether the government should use taxpayers' money to subsidize farmers, now, why this farm laws and also stated what waits for India if the farm laws are implemented. He tried to highlight the issues on allowing foreign direct investment in Indian retail trade on the perspective of long term security, as well as he talked about recent Supreme Court uh, uh, opinions. He talked about the systematic transfer of our natural resources, especially focusing on the use and misuse of water. He talked about the decadal. Uh, constant erosion of farmers' income due to the uh, context of agricultural in the context of agriculture and GDP, uh, constant uh, shrinking of investment in the farming sector, the questions of land holding, the subsidies, the, 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 the uh, comparing he compared the subsidies given by uh, our country with the other uh, USA and European unions, and obviously he. Uh, raise the issues regarding the easier option of considering the, uh, the organic foods to export uh, for our country. And he also highlighted uh, the contract farming that was started uh, during the British period in Bengal and the present context in Maharashtra and, and their effect, as well as he also uh, talked about the effect of uh, Mandis, uh, the, the effect of these uh, new bills on the Mandis and as well as consumers' perspectives, whether they are the elites or the millions Indians, uh, and they are, um, uh, whether they are consuming organic products as well as the millions of people who are consuming the junk foods. So there are so many things that I, that I might left, but due to time's constant, I'm stopping myself here. So thank you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule.